Yes, thank you very much for this nice introduction and thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you very much Goethe Institute, thank you very much Cryptic for uh, sending me here to do some research for a possible future project, we will see. And thank you for being here and uh, listening to me, which is very nice. Um, um, yeah, it was a very nice introduction. So basically what I would start like to start with is to elaborate a little about my background because um, uh, I think it tells something how I approach opera. I, ne I, I never expected or never even planned or never had the idea of creating an opera. Um, that has several reasons. Um, firstly, I never felt attached to the um, classical way of singing. Um, this changed during the recent years, profoundly. And um, I never felt attached to this kind of opera world, to the audience, to the creators. And um, also, I never actually never thought of even the possibility to ever get a commission for, for an opera as there was some kind of, uh, as usual, there are the networks and I'm not part of a network which would naturally lead to an opera commission. Now you're making the light dark on the audience and I would like to ask you if you could make it brighter again because, yes, perfect, thank you. <laughs> so, um, while I'm telling this, I did many jobs and still do many jobs. So I started out as a guitar player, uh, studying wise. Um, at the same time, um, as, so I studied classical guitar. Um, and at the same time before, uh, I was, uh, was earning my money as a sound engineer. And um, uh, as a live sound engineer and as a studio sound engineer. Uh, theater and um, it pretty soon was obvious to me that the classical guitar is not my way through life and I uh, wanted to compose um, my own music. Um, I wanted to study composition which in Germany was for me impossible at the time. I think it changed a little but at the time it was totally clear if you wanted to study composition you had to be a really good piano player. I'm a guitarist, so there was no way to it. Also, uh, the style of, of, of teaching and then the classical composition departments uh, were not very appealing to me. And at the same time, I got more and more into, into sound installations and installation art. And uh, so I became a student at the Art Academy. And I was doing quite a lot of work at the, at the Art Academy before I then finally realized that indeed the discourse of fine arts or visual arts um, is kind of my discourse, but I come from music. So my thinking is not the visual artist thinking, but um, is really a musical thinking. What really the difference is, is of course a very relevant, interesting question. And I still don't really know the exact answer, but that might be a good question for later. So, um, um, finally, I found my composition program, which was then in the Netherlands, in The Hague. Um, uh, not on the short path, but in between, I abandoned art completely and went into advertising. So I used my sound engineering background to produce commercials, radio commercials, TV commercials. Uh, in a kind of heroic, I want to get to know my enemy attitude. <laughs> so uh, very. Uh, before I soon realized, okay, this is also not my thing and uh, I'm really interested in film and I made the pretty straight the way into sound designing for film, film mixing. Had a very good time there as well. But then turning 30, I realized, no, this is my life should and will be about composing and then I finally um, finished, did and finished my composition studies to put this chapter to rest. My specialty uh, uh, was through my art background also and my theater background uh, 
this kind of Netherlandish Belgian music theater practice, which is, um, it, I think the main difference is that uh, compared to, to, to German theater, this changed now, but from 20 years ago or so, is that it's not language driven, but music or even technology driven. So the teacher of my teacher, Dick Reimarkes, who died some years ago, he's kind of the grandfather of the Netherlands uh, music theater scene. My teacher was Chrius von Berheik. And he um, did pieces like, like extreme slow motions of a guy falling off a bike. And he called that the fall of Mussolini. <laughs> so uh, you, would, you, would, you would witness, uh, a, he did it with a dancer, uh, like a bicycle crashing against a stone, I think, or a little wall, and then making this überschlag, what's that in English? Um, and this was stretched to an hour. So really it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's actually kind of a technical process, but um, at, at the same time, a very poetical process. Uh, another piece which I'm really fond of is uh, 10 Ways to Destroy a Microphone. So because uh, if you, <laughs> if you, for example, take a lighter and uh, heat it for a longer time, it will, of course, die. But this very moment, it dies. It makes a sound on its own. It starts to become a musical instrument. And if you if you just prolong it, if you make it just if you push it, really like. Uh, slowly to this point where it's dying and p stretch this very moment, you get this music which a microphone is making, and it's uh, it's 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 uh, it's so this is technical, it's poetic, but it's also ironic and it's actually quite funny, and um, this is this kind of work is is very influential to to my own artistic thinking. Probably you will see that. Um, yeah, and then, then, then um, I uh, did and still do a lot of like applied music for films uh, in this very beautiful biographical notice uh, uh, written by, no, not Michael, but Annika, yeah. Um, thank you again. Uh, you read that I worked with Michel Welbeck for his film. Um, he, um, he, he directed his own filmic adaptation of uh, La, uh, La Possibilité de Nil, The Possibility of an Island, uh, a big movie with a big music budget, which failed completely. So. <laughs> and I do a lot of theater. So I'm, I'm, most of all, I consider myself a theater maker. Um, I work a lot as a musician, as a composer for theater, and I had the honor to work with, with really great directors like uh, Luc Perceval or, or Andreas Kriegenburg or uh, Christoph Loy or whatever. And um, this, of course, is one of the best schools you can get to work with good people. And so this is my background. And then suddenly, which is a, a story on its own, uh, I got the commission for creating an opera in uh, this hall, which is uh, like 2,000 seats. And um, it's big. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a, 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 it's Montpellier, southern France. And I had two problems then. Of course, if you get a commission like that, you don't refuse it, it's, it's, that's for sure. So even if I told you before that I didn't feel attached to opera, of, of, of course, if you get a commission like that, sure, you go for it. So, um, um, so I had one problem to solve, what to do with my anti-operatic thinking. So what actually should I communicate to an opera audience which I didn't feel attached to? That was my main question, which kept me busy for one or two years. And the other one was of actually because I, I, I have this longer tradition, I have a longer tradition being a servant, a musical servant to directors than actually 
uh, uh, creating my own artwork, which is a completely different attitude, actually. And uh, so I had suddenly 2,000 people in the audience waiting for my statement. So th this kind of um, uh, was the fire was, which was burning for one or two years of well, what shall I do? And um, um, so I made a list, actually. I made a list of what I hate in opera and what I love in opera. And then I made a list of what things I would like to see and hear in my opera. And I just, this was basically my guideline. In combination with a very, uh, with an anecdote. Um, so one year, roughly one year before the premiere, I went there for a, for a, a pre-meeting and, and uh, and Montpellier, there, there are no flights from Munich to Montpellier, so I had to go through Marseille. And there, they were kind enough to pick me up with the driver, so we had a two-hour car ride to Montpellier. And um, there was a young guy driving me, and we had the radio on, and there was a special um, Sendung uh, program. program about Radiohead. So for two years, driving through the southern France landscape, I heard this uh, voice of Tom uh, York, and um, it sank into me. And then I, 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 and I mean, whenever I hear him, I'm kind of like it's, it's I'm, I'm feel like a softened cloth or whatever. It's, and um, I expected Montpellier to be this kind of provincial. Um, uh, quiet, boring city. But when then after this two hours of Radiohead journey, I arrived there on a Thursday evening on a warm late summer night and the streets were full, completely full uh, with students enjoying their lives. And not only students, but like people um, hanging out in the street. And it was really beautiful. And um, then I knew, okay, this is my audience actually. So and then it became much easier because then the, from this point on, I, I had the uh, I had the, the um, I overcame that fear to composing for others. But then it just was a, just I, I felt free to do something which I which was for me in a way because I felt more attached to this. When I decided for this audience, it was felt near closer to me. Was that a sentence? You understand? Okay. <laughs> um, so um, it was clear that there will be quite a lot of elements in it which are more related to pop music than to the contemporary classical music world. Um, um, which is basically how I, I'm, I'm, as a listener, I, I really listen to uh, so many different musics. And if you ask me what's your favorite music, I would not even know what to answer you because I'm, I'm not a judger. I'm, I, I'm a liker. So I, I really, and I, I try to understand why people like this or this, uh, even with the crappy music. And uh, usually with a certain set of angles, the crappy music can become something really interesting artistically. So it's really important to be open to everything. And um, What I observe mostly in the art music world is this kind of, oh, we have to be really concentrated on the very few elements. And, um, and I said, no, I want to be really open to the world. And to want to, I want to bring everything together. And I want to be really this kind of I mean, if you go to the internet, it's all full, and you d jump from link to link, and this this kind of feeling that the the world is open to you. This is something I would I wanted to communicate. And then there's the problem of singing. Um, there's this basic thing that um, the classical singing style has a. a is developed because it needed to be heard in a, quite a distance. So, I mean, in this 2,000 seat auditorium, you cannot survive with a voice like mine. I need a microphone. Um, so to reach the balcony there in the third floor, you need some 
type of singing, otherwise he won't be heard, even, especially if you have an orchestra. And um, um, but I, so we are accustomed to microphone singing. That's what we are used to. So um, I wanted to to mix amplified with non-amplified singing to actually to make the non-amplified singing even more special. If you get what I mean. And um, another problem I have with uh, with a, a classical uh, operatic setting or basically the classical music setting is the uh, kind of bourgeois stability of the orchestra. I mean, it's so fixed. It's so it's so like a piano. You can't move it. You can you cannot mold it. It's it's like it's like a way too heavy furniture which you can't move. And you and the same was with the orchestra. It has a kind of uh, it's always kind of polished um, in the sense that you, you that you don't get roughness from it, only with very big effort and. There, made myself a, my, my life a little easier uh, in inviting uh, improvising musicians. So on top of this orchestral layer, I had three musicians with whom I worked quite a lot before, and they hardly had any notes in the score. It was all developed imp uh, during the rehearsals, what they play where and when. And this gave, a, a, for me, a very interesting layer of um, uh, in um, how do you say? Um, uh, I don't even know the German word. So unexpected. I, I wanted to have something which even I didn't couldn't expect what would happen. Uh, I tell much more than I thought, uh, than I should. Um, I skipped now the, uh, 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 the, the the whole opera was conceived really in a team. That's also some, some, some very different to usual operatic praxis, where the where there's a, the, 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 the li, li, libretto writer writing a text, then comes the composer composing the music to it, and then comes the director putting it on stage. We all did it as a team from the very first moment together. So we developed the pictures, we developed the text, we developed the music at the same time. And sometimes there was music first, sometimes there was text first, sometimes there was stage setting first, or a, even a costume. Um, but I won't elaborate on the text now because I'm completely running out of time already. So <laughs> um, I show you now uh, a, a short trailer version of Jetzt, which is a one hour piece. We, uh, it was a double bill with another opera. Um, and this trailer version is a three or four minute thing and you get a kind of uh, impression what this thing was about.
Um, so there are a lot of actually extremely many references to uh, works from contemporary radio or from the traditional music history. And I do that because um, um, sometimes I pr a little provocatively I, 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 I say that I'm not a composer, I'm a DJ, which is not entirely true, but it uh, gives some hint. Uh, I do that because I'm interested in context. So um, um, it's not it's not the material itself, or, or it's not the, the thing I invent, but uh, I like putting things in context. And if I use elements or musics which are recognizable, then the context, of course, is much clearer and much faster to uh, communicate. Um, out of uh, this event uh, came at the same opera. A house, uh, another commission, and two years later for uh, an opera uh, called Happy Happy. Um, in the, actually, this little town of Maupier has two rooms <laughs> one big uh, Le Corum and uh, the old uh, La Comédie, smaller one. So this happened here in the smaller, uh, older um, opera house. Um, two, I'm trying to make it faster now because um, two things which which uh, were my main experiences or main learnings from from uh, this Jetzt opera was that indeed opera can is able to to give that feeling of now Jetzt is German for now and. Um, so by the, the operatic praxis, like it is uh, uh, done with, with all the repertoire work, it, it feels uh, like a museum immediately when you enter the opera, and it doesn't necessarily be so. And it's so opposite to, to what I uh, practice in, in, the, in the straight theater world, where it's all about being today and, and, and actually looking for topics which are really like politically uh, important at this very moment. And um, I hoped to make uh, an even more my question was uh, to, to the next opera, is it actually possible to get to, to give, give this immediacy also to an opera piece? This might be obsolete. It, it's not an opera for the future or for eternity or for the books of history. Or it, it might be completely useless in a year or so because it's not relevant anymore. This, um, um, and uh, the, some years before, there was... Um, uh, uh, financial crisis. We had uh, this very this little book by um, Stefan Essel, "Empört euch," which is in English. F French is "Indignez vous," and in English it's uh, like "Be angry." Yeah? Be angry. So uh, uh, this little text by a very old man um, who doesn't understand why the youth is not angry about what happens currently in society. And um, instead of bringing this text on stage, I, I was researching for, for uh, all the moments which actually should make us angry and uh, put them on the stage like on the, on the first page of the newspaper. Like you have all these glimpses and all the short texts and if you want to get dig deeper into it, then you have to turn pages and go into it. In this opera, I never did it. So it's a, I, I call it an operatic song cycle with party. So, um, it's 14 scenes and, and it splashes here, splashes there, and it, 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 my idea was to, 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 um, um, to, to, to communicate this, this feeling of, of uh, Überforderung. Overbearing, overbearing. Um, like, like at one point you have to stop reading the newspaper, otherwise you you go mad, you know. And um, 
parallel to, to, to this situation, I, I set a, a, a singer, which is uh, which actually doesn't want to do anything else than singing, and society doesn't let her to do so. This is a very short version of what's going on there. In uh, Jetzt, I worked with a libertist, with a writer, Jonas Lüscher, uh, who's a philosopher at the same time. You might got a glimpse of that through the subtitles. It's actually a quite complex uh, thing. And uh, uh, for Happy Happy, I was responsible for the text as well. So I did this kind of uh, recomposing, uh, DJing with the text as well. So it was collecting texts and influences. Did my own texts is, and um, so this kind of collage thing. So the concept of singing, the more I dealt with opera, the, the, this idea of singing became more and more important to me. There's also this interesting um, question, what was before in humanity, uh, in human life, the singing or the speaking? Uh, there are a lot of uh, hints which tell us that singing was before. But then is the, the question is, is uh, the singing in, in opera, is it more like the uh, the poetic reflection, when language is not 
able to co to, to communicate the, with the, the, the topic anymore? Or is it kind of a pre-formulated language, like uh, Heiner uh, Müller liked it to be? Uh, Because of the subtitles, I have to use two dope programs and no, no. And um, I more and more realized that we live in a society where, where we don't sing anymore. I mean, uh, we listen to a lot of radio, but it's, uh, I'm, I have this impression that singing was much more kind of part of our lives in earlier times than it is today. And there's, um, for, for many, many people, including me, before I did operas, uh, the, the, this classical singing style is completely weird and uh, feels alien to a lot of people. And um, being inside this operatic process and rehearsing with them and, and, and really working with the singers and, and, and getting accustomed to it and, and realizing how the body actually is made for a classical singing. Actually, this is kind of what the body wants. Um, became even more weird that, that, that singing seems so anti-natural, so artificial to us. But at the same time, this is the quality of opera. So, um, because it's so artificial, it's, it's so outside of our daily lives, we can open up a world which is, uh, which is some, it's a completely, we open up a door and we are in a completely different realm. I mean, we can discuss topics and, and communicate topics which I couldn't get close to you in a talk. Um, so, um, I mean, the first National Opera of Montpellier gave me already those two commissions and then uh, uh, at the same time, the director, which gave me the commission, was not the director there anymore. And um, for various other reasons, this kind of operatic endeavor stopped here for me. But I'm pretty sure it will go on later in my life. But um, um, but but uh, since then, I'm looking for other ways how to 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 be operatic. Um, and how to, to act operatic, and how to, to create operatic art. And then came along this commission which um, led to the work from last year uh, called Viola, uh, which was a very nice commission. Uh, it's actually a fine art commission. Um, so there's, there's uh, I just learned it also here, there's this uh, in, in public construction work or public house building uh, you have to actually reserve some money for art in public space. And uh, this is an area um, uh, nearby Munich, or it's in Munich, but one of the, the, the outskirts settings, which they completely rebuilt infrastructurally. And it's, uh, it had actually very little uh, public space to make this big uh, um, uh, sculpture or whatever. And then they had this uh, very nice idea to make a, an art festival, a temporary art festival, invited 15 artists, I was one of them, um, with the assignment to actually uh, get in touch with the private space, with the shop owners, with the inhabitants there, and to, to build up uh, corporations and to actually go into the private space as well. And. Uh, uh, I was researching the, the place and, and realized at some point that there's an enormous density of uh, 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 doctors and pharmacies. It's like every second house is a, is a house of uh, uh, doctors and in, in the other houses there are pharmacies, like every second building. And so this is a kind, this is a place of sickness. and. Um, um, 
So I started thinking about pharmacies and what they mean to us today, and then I made the connection to opera because kind of the the the, the pharmacy is our modern equivalent of uh, salvation. In the Wagnerian sense, like we go into the pharmacy to expect salvation from our pain and suffering. <laughs> so <laughs> there I had the link to opera, and um, <laughs> and uh, after some research, I found. I found this um, pharmacy, which is uh, uh, on the train, uh, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the other side, it, it's facing the train station of, of, of Pasing, which is uh, how this square is called. And this is what it came to be. So uh, this, the audience, just arriving for the premiere, uh, is sitting inside the pharmacy. Uh, here we have some they are not in there yet, so I'm here with my laptop. I put chairs, and you actually were looking through the windows outside. You were directly sitting at the window and uh, looking outside on the square. And uh, this is how it looked from the outside. So, uh, um, When I was researching the pharmacies, I, I, I suddenly I, I, I saw this window and, and I looked out of on, on the square and I, I immediately realized this is an artwork, like this is a piece already. I, you just have to make it readable, like uh, understandable that this actually like all, everything, how the, the people, how they move, the energy which is there. This is, um, I just have to, transport it as, as uh, converted into an art space. Actually, the, so the square is my actual, it's not my artwork, it's, it's uh, existed already, it's a found object. Um, um, so, um, so here's one early experience I made. I once was, a, as a young guy, was sitting in a park with a lot of people on a very sudden day and then there was this uh, Zeppelin. What is a Zeppelin in English? Zeppelin. Flying over the park with this drone sound. And suddenly the whole park became like an installation piece through this drone. The drone made everything connected, which was a complete surreal experience. So this is basically what I did with, by, by placing an opera singer on the square. So you would look outside the window, and there would appear my opera singer, which is her. And uh, the character we found uh, uh, worked with a with a, a writer, a theater writer actually, Thomas uh, Jonik. And we found a character which is uh, who is um, a bit lost sad, she would return to the square regularly to expect her lover to meet there because they met there quite a, in earlier times regularly, that was their meeting point. But obviously he doesn't come anymore. And this, um, this loss kind of, I would not say traumatized, but this kind of, this, um, Let's keep it to traumatize her. So the, the, she she appears there as as, uh, uh, as a person being lost in space, lost in time, speaking with herself, singing with herself, uh, but also approaching other people and then again being close to herself, encapsulated. And um, also here I have a little trailer version of that. Haben Sie mal das Tat 
Ständig. Warum fühlt sich das Leben so lang an? Warum kann man nicht sterben? Warum lenkt er mich nicht wie oder? Warum ist er nicht da? Ist das jetzt innen oder außen? können mich anfassen, ich fühl's, ich bin da. Mich gibt's, mich gibt's, ich bin. Ich bin doch nicht tot, ich doch nicht tot, ich doch nicht. Was ist, wie wär's? Hätten Sie Lust auf einen Kaffee vielleicht oder ein Glas Wein nach der Oper? Ich mag eigentlich keine Oper, aber zu zweit ist alles leicht, da finden Sie nicht auch. Take 
Um, the opera actually here is, a, 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 a call it more an, an energy source for, for what's happening on the square and what's happening in this really complex network of uh, surveillance. Because um, um, it starts out as a classic audience situation, like audience sitting somewhere, watching somewhere, but then uh, the, the people outside recognize that they are observed through the window, and it's actually really a kind of strange perspective to see a group of people inside a pharmacy watching outside at you. And then uh, they look weird, of course, who wouldn't? Um, but then you, sitting inside the pharmacy, realize you're becoming yourself an, a subject of the piece. So um, it's uh, pretty soon very unclear who actually is a protagonist in this piece. Viola, the character, the singing character, or the protagonists out on the square, or actually the people inside the pharmacy. Um, uh, musically, one you might have recognized the Magic Flute by Mozart. So actually, the the, the uh, character, the, the kind of story we tell here is that they, when she was still with the lover, they once visited the Taba Flute, which was an extraordinarily experience for her, and that's kind of it's this repetitive. Repeti repetitive memory and she kind of uh, grows into into being uh, Pamina or whatever while well, the the area which we with the Achich feels what's that in English oh I feel I feel it yeah I better translate it so I'm already actually as I said, I am start talking too much. So um, I could tell you a little bit about a project I'm currently finishing, which is this uh, smartphone thing, uh, which is an opera for a walk, uh, for a specific path I chose at the Munich River Isar. Uh, what I was interested in here is this ritual of going into the theater. One of the specialties about not only opera, but every cultural event is that you actually have to move yourself. You have to move your butt up to actually get moved by music or whatever. And this is something which is getting lost in, in, in our uh, living room uh, consummation. It, it, it still had something when you had this record player and you had the needle and you put it on the record and then you sit down. It still has this kind of ritual, but even now we have the smartphone, whatever. So I, 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 um, I once want, wanted to kind of radicalize this ritual of moving yourself to get moved. So uh, this is an opera conceived for, for this specific path. It's using the uh, landscape there in terms of content and music. And to experience it, you download an app, which I'm currently finishing to program. And uh, you only can listen to it, you only can experience it if you actually walk there. So I couldn't even demonstrate it here, because you actually have to be right there. Um, which is also some kind of uh, um, possible onto to this ubiquity of everything is available everywhere and trying to uh, artificially minimize access to make something more worth, not in a monetary sense, but in a perceived sense. Um, yeah, so you actually have to walk this opera. It's an opera you walk. Um, there are trailer versions which I cannot really show. I actually use virtual reality lenses to, 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 to transport you to the River Isa, which is, works, but not in this setting. Um, and uh, two weeks ago, I had the premiere of another installment of this uh, uh, 
I call it now a format, what I developed through Viola. Uh, it's called Katharina, which is uh, it's going more into the city center in Munich. And uh, it, it happened here on this tram spot. And uh, people were sitting inside this travel agency. So here the operatic link is not salvation anymore, but the escapism, the longing to some a distant, distant, actually distant place, which I wanted to um, elaborate on, or which was my setting. And this is also a, a socially interesting part because it's um, it's it's uh, uh, it's at the border between this really wealthy uh, bourgeois Munich, where all the High educated, uh, multi, uh, high, high paid employees go in when they are moving to Munich. So they, um, they, they, um, oh, my English. So um, actually, the, the people who are like Schwabing is, is, is this old. Uh, Area where, where artists used to live some 120 years ago, and um, there is hardly anybody living there anymore, of course, because it's the prices went so high, and this place is at the border to this to this, I call it new wealthy Schwabing and the outer Schwabing, which is where they all are pushed outside, um, and. Uh, uh, since I'm a victim of that as well, and it made me really aggressive at times, um, uh, there came this motive of anger back into my work. So Katharina is, is somebody, um, it's the same actor, and it could be actually the same person, but it could be also a different person. Same singer, actor. So she actually lost everything now. She uh, has no job anymore, no flat anymore. That's everything she has. And out of this um, loss, she gets really angry. She, she, she's in, uh, on this, uh, on, on this, uh, in this moment to leave every societal norm. And um, she starts really being aggressive against the people. Yeah. Is not so interesting, um, and, uh, and like like a Cassandra, she's uh, predicting the future of people she sees, like the bad future, of course. Everybody will die, and um, so it's a very it's way more like Viola is a sad person, pretty much encapsulated. And Katharina uh, is, is, is still encapsulated in the way that she can't share and she doesn't really want to share her emotion. But she's, like, she, she's really aggressive against the others. Um, again, it's, it's, uh, I'm using a window, um, a singer and laptop. And... Um, the, 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 there's one main difference. You see the headphones there. Actually, there was some beautiful electroacoustical setup in, in Viola. Actually, I didn't use any conventional loudspeakers. I was, I was very curious about the window itself as a, as a, as a sounding device. So in the very recent years, there were new developments about transducer technology, which transforms uh, the window into a sounding speaker. So the window, the, the voice from Viola came actually through the window. There was no speaker at the side. It came really directly out of the window. Uh, here was interested in something else. I wanted to 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 really uh, give you the perspective of the singer outside. So I gave the singer two microphones, and the audience had a headphone. And uh, actually, you would listen to to how it sounds for her. And you sit here on on, on the chairs or stand there, and you're, it's kind of a societal event, like you're an audience, but with the headphones you're alone again. And this is uh, kind of an extension. Uh, 
Yeah, that's how it was. So um, there I don't have a trailer version. Um, I only have the full version so far, which is 16 minutes. It's now I'm already over time. I don't know what you would like to prefer, like now starting Q&A or watching the whole piece. That would be great. There are also no subtitles, so. <laughs> but I, uh, I have an English translation, and it would be nice if, uh, for example, Carrie, could you read one or two pages one of the, the of the English translation? So then you get at least an idea what she's speaking. I just have to get it from her back. Yeah. <laughs> so, just uh, you don't need to read. No, 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 no. no just, just so, so you get an impression okay. what the text is about, and then you can see the piece. Okay. <laughs> Cunt, asshole. Not you. I mean love, and certainly not you. Don't look now as if you were happy. No later than half a year, your partner will leave you, and then you are standing there, worthless, speechless, placeless, in high-heeled shoes, thrown out. Love is an asshole, and happiness is a cunt. Black holes, abysses, crevices, ravines, no matter, no light, nothing. Me, me, me. Don't forget me. The clock is ticking, and... Which name do you give her? Viola? Pamina? Pamina only after the opera, of course. Do you even know the name of the unsuspecting woman at your side? Katharina. Katharina. And ever, uh, ever thought about it? Katharina. Don't you pride yourself on always being happy. In three months, after your trip to Indonesia, you'll have malaria and syphilis. So much for being happy together. You'll never see your Katharina again. Don't forget me. Me, me, me. Carpet, anyone? Purchased in Marrakesh over two years ago? Souvenirs, souvenirs. Long live the love, he said. Our love. Isn't that something for you? Or you? Or you, maybe? No, not you. Your apartment will never be a love nest. In one week, you'll get a letter from your landlord. Termination without notice. I can see that. And from that, on, and from that on, it's all downhill. And you, above all, you don't need anything. Don't look so happy. I know you think that you are flying to India in three days, but your plane will crash. Down, down, down. I see that. Into a black hole, into the abyss. No survivors into the grave. Carpet, unused, as good as new. Someone, don't look at me so condescendingly, so contemptuously, so dismissively. You are the one who is unhappy, not me. I'm not, not me. Continue. <laughs> Homo sapiens. Man is a man, an Neanderthal man, a cunt, an asshole who will be hit by lightning, turn into a pillar of salt so that he can never fly to Morocco again, never again pretend love, never lie again, cheat, obliterate, annihilate, destroy, forget. I don't stare at me like that. Respect me, Katharina. Take notice of me. Why are you ignoring me, Katharina? Am I air? Am I an abyss? Am I nothing? Me. Do not stare at me as if I don't exist. Think. Yes, you. Better think about whether your trip to Thailand really was such a good idea 
and the daily visits at underage prostitutes. Not later than one week and you are lying inside of an isolation ward. Hepatitis B. I can see that. I can see that. Me. Don't forget me. Don't forget me. Don't forget me. Forward, backward, continue, upward. No movement is possible anymore. Nothing. Everything is abyss. Below, mankind will perish. I can see that. All these men and women who live their lives together, swear fidelity to each other, make love on some Moroccan souvenirs. A carpet, for example. No. No movement. Nothing is possible anymore. Out. End. Gone. For you. 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 And you. And especially for you, you arsehole type. And for you. And you. We will never meet again. Me. Me. I see myself. I can see myself. How I go. How I take my suitcase, my, my carpet. I can see myself. I go and go and go. On and on and on. Until finally, everything is getting too difficult. Until I break down. I will, from a broken heart, as the poets say. Heart failure, the physicians say. Three, two, soon the time has come. I want to, I don't want to. Katharina, me, don't forget. Thank you. So the, the, the don't forget me is of course a quote from Dido and Aeneas, Henry Purcell. And basically the whole piece is uh, musically is a remix of Purcell's Dido and Aeneas. And the main difference to Purcell is that our Dido is not dying, but becoming a theory.
Arschloch! Nicht sie. Ich meine die Liebe. Sie erst recht nicht. Gucken Sie bloß nicht so, als wären Sie glücklich. Spätestens in einem halben Jahr hat Ihr Partner Sie verlassen. Und dann stehen Sie da. Wertlos, wortlos, ortlos, in hochhackigen Schuhen verstoßen. Die Liebe ist eine Arschloch. Und das Glück ist eine Fotze. Schwarze Löcher. Abgründe. Lüfte. Schluchten. Keine Materie. Kein Nichts. Ich, 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 ich. Vergesst mich nicht. Viola, Pamina, Pamina sicher nur nach der Oper. Wissen Sie überhaupt, wie die ahnungslose Frau an Ihrer Seite heißt? Katharina, Katharina, schon mal drüber nachgedacht? Fühlen Sie sich bloß nicht ein, das Glück gepachtet zu haben. Was dann zum Thema Zweisamkeit? Ihre Katharina, sehen Sie dann nie wieder. Vergesst mich nicht. Ich, 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 ich. Ich. Irgendjemand? Gekauft in Marrakesch? Nein? Vor zwei Jahren. Souvenirs, Souvenirs. Es lebe die Liebe, hat er gesagt. Vive l'amour, notre amour. Wäre das was für Sie? Oder Sie? Oder Sie? Vielleicht? Nein? Nein, für Sie nicht. Ihre Wohnung wird nie ein Liebesnest. 
In einer Woche erhalten Sie nämlich einen Brief von Ihrem Vermieter. Fristlose Kündigung, ich kann das sehen. Und von da an geht's bergauf. Hm, hm, hm. Und Sie da. Sie brauchen erst recht nichts. Gucken Sie nicht so zufrieden, ich weiß. Sie denken, dass Sie in drei Tagen nach Indien fliegen. <lacht> Aber Ihre Maschine stürzt ab, 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 ab. Ich sehe das ins schwarze Loch, ins Grab. Keine Überlebenden. Teppich ist unbenutzt. So gut wie neu, hey. Irgendjemand? Hey. Sie brauchen mich gar nicht so herablassend anzusehen, so verachtend, so abschätzig. Sie sind derjenige, der unglücklich ist, nicht ich. Ich nicht. Ich nicht. Ich nicht. Ich nicht. Nicht ich. Der Mensch ist ein Mann. Ein Neandertaler. Eine Fotze. Ein Arschloch, das vom Schlag getroffen werden wird. Zur Salzsäule erstarren, damit es nie wieder nach Marokko fliegen kann. Nie wieder lieber heuscheln. Nie wieder lügen. Betrügen. Auslöschen, vernichten, zerstören, vergessen nicht. Betrügen, auslöschen, vernichten, zerstören, vergessen, betrügen, auslöschen, vernichten, zerstören, vergessen, betrügen, auslöschen, vernichten, zerstören, vergessen nicht. Ich 
Prostituierten besuche jeden Tag. Spätestens in einer Woche liegen sie nämlich auf der Isolierstation. Ich kann das sehen. Hepatitis B. ist mehr möglich. Nichts, alles ist. Abgrund ist. Unten. Die Menschheit wird zugrunde gehen, ich kann das sehen. Und all die Männer und Frauen, die ein Leben lang zusammengehören, sich Liebe schwören und Liebe machen auf irgendwelchen marokkanischen Souvenirs, einem Teppich zum Beispiel. Nein, nichts. Ist mehr möglich. Aus, Ende, vorbei für Sie, Sie, Sie und Sie und für Sie ganz besonders, Sie Arschlochtyp und für Sie, Sie, Sie und Sie. wie die Dichter sagen, Herzinsuffizienz, die Medizin. Zwei, drei gleich. Ist es soweit? Katharina. Ihr vergesst mich nicht. Ihr vergesst mich nicht. Ihr vergesst mich nicht. <laughs> um, I, I have it. I suppose it's, it's some sort of, of expert question. Um, I have several, in fact, but I start with one. Um, and that's got to do with what I perceive to be, and I'm following it to a certain extent, 
um, your own explanations to be a kind of clash or contrast between, on the one hand, um, the world of magic, which is the mm. world of opera, um, mm. where everything. Oh, great! Thank mm. you. Where everything. Oh, I'm not the second. No, it's switched on. Oh, it is. Oh, oh yeah. Um, where everything is heightened, emotion is heightened, perception is heightened, and so on. And on the other hand, um, complete mundanity. You know, um, nothing can be more mundane than um, a suburban uh, tram station, and it isn't even. A, fully ugly trip. It's com completely nondescript. Um, um, and so I was, and to a certain extent, I think in more, perhaps more complicated ways, um, from the way you described your, um, and the, from what you've seen, your um, stage operas as well, there is a similar thing going on with, with certain elements that, that play with this um, hyper-artificiality of opera and certain elements that clearly do not quite fit into this world. And I was wondering about the role of that music has in, in that, that kind of contrast, because the way it seems here, at least in these passages, very clearly it's music that makes the magic, that stands in for it, right? Um, and that produces that um, heightened um, perception, which of course, um, the, um, some of the um, unwitting actors are not aware that they play a, a role in. Um, but on the other hand, all of that magic is borrowed, or not all of it, but a lot of it is. So um, the, these are uh, bits and pieces from the history of opera and from certain other elements that have all been there before. And in that sense, you could say it's kind of second-hand magic. It isn't, it isn't real. And so I wonder what that says about yeah, this kind of contrast that is established in the first place between the mundane and the magical. If the magical is fake as well, as, as it were. Hmm. Isn't art always fake? Well, it has a promise. It promises not to be. I think it. I, I, I think I, I disagree completely. <coughs> Actually, I have I have most joy when I realize it's complete fake. And uh, um, actually, in, in, in film, which is supposed to be the complete immersed medium, there are some filmmakers who are masters in telling you, in, in, in immersing you completely, in, suck you into the film. And at the same time telling you, hey, this is a film. And then you become aware of being sucked into a film, and you become aware of this process of, of being sucked in, and then actually the, the process of listening and watching, and, and then some, some, something magical happens, but it's not... I would argue that the magic is different than the pieces is trying to complete you, to, to be completely original. And I'm also um, I actually don't really buy the concept of originality. That's uh, in a way we I haven't are. used it. Yeah, no, <laughs> It's uh, always this, this discussion, and uh, I, it's really, but you said second hand. I'm not sure if, if uh, I mean, if I hear a piece of music twice, is the second time I hear it, actually most of the time uh, it, it grows in me, the magic actually. So I'm not sure if I really understand the second hand thing. I don't know, maybe it's connected to a question that I um, had, which is who is the audience of, um, of these sort of performative opera installations? Because I think that goes together with the second hand question in so far as would they be rather people um, from your experience 
no opera history, so we will be sort of able to um, to understand that these are sort of samples of quotes from music history, or are these, you know, rather people without that background, or do you have any knowledge about that? Well, I try to make the piece for both, basically. So, um, of course, I, I mean, I can love, I love a lot when I hear this intro of the, the curl of the furious and see the people passing by. Uh, but that's of course an inside joke. But inside jokes are nice. <laughs> and uh, for the others, it's just a very hectic oral thing. It doesn't matter at all if it's for seven or do, do we have questions from the audience, maybe? I don't really see anything uh, that. I can also try to project my voice. I'm not <laughs> always good at that, but I'll try. I don't know. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mattis, for that uh, long and uh, interesting talk. Uh, maybe a follow-up follow -up, follow -up question about the audiences, maybe in plural. Um, because you, you mentioned that there is a particular opera audience and that you especially chose different ones for your operas. And uh, mentioned that students scene in Marseille, yeah, Montpellier. Montpellier sorry about it. Um, and thinking about the traditional operas you reference in your work, um, I was thinking about the role of gender in your different opera works, and how also especially the role of a pair, of a couple, um, is portrayed and is re-referenced by you and not destabilized in any way. And that as a non-expert question coming from theater studies, you know, <laughs> feminisms. <and> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I consider myself more a theater maker than an opera composer. Um, what was the first part of the question? The role of gender, like, I mean... No, there was, there was one before. The different audiences. Yeah, I, actually, there I have to say that uh, um, it's, it's, the stereotypes have their role, uh, and uh, but one thing I learned there is not the opera audience. So this was of course a famous assumption. Um, there is of course a tendency, especially if you go to more more provincial Germany, then you have this uh, silver sea, like we call it, like this very gray haired audience. Um, but but um, well, what I learned is that actually it's not so. It's not a good idea to think too much about the audience. It's, uh, it comes the right audience comes anyway. Um, gender is an interesting question. Well, there are, are there any couples in the pieces? No, not at all. They are all broken up actually. Um, I never really thought about gender, like, like there's no conscious thought about gender in those pieces, it's just they develop like they are. But, um, there's a tendency that there's a woman, that's simply because um, this is such a great singer and we can really work together a lot, so that's actually why it's a woman. If uh, well, they have established a, 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 such a close working relationship with a male singer, um, so there is no conscious decision for, for uh, gender here. I don't think I have an answer to this question. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Mathis. I, I want to ask you about whether you're consciously, have been consciously influenced, uh, your work's been influenced, shaped by contemporary performance, contemporary theatre, uh, as opposed to traditions of opera and contemporary music and fine art. I was very struck when you were talking earlier on about, you said when you approached Montpellier, uh, the question you said, well, what sort of opera would I like to see on stage? And I'm remembering almost exact words that Tim Etchell's director of Force Entertainment says when he's thinking about the work they make. What sort of theatre would I like to see on stage? And I'm also thinking of the kind of relationship you have with traditional opera, which again with this company is so 
similar to the relationship they have with traditional theatre. They love it and they loathe it. Uh, but they're trying to find something to do with it in the 21st century. So uh, that's just a particular example, but I'm wondering more broadly about how contemporary performance impacts on your work. I love what Do you mean in this case performance like performance art or performance like theatre staging? Where theatre meets performance art. Yeah, yeah. Experimental theatre, call it what you will. Well, generally, it seems that that, um, that, that German theatre is much more performance art now than theatre, like uh, especially like the French are used to. I mean, this is kind of really um, they do the theatre the Germans did like 20 years ago, and um, so if I'm approaching opera, like I used to work in German straight theatre, uh, it's completely alien. Them, in a way, um, a double alien. Uh, if I would do straight theatre, like that, it's already alien, but an opera is even more uh, uh, conservative in this regard. But there's this piece on the stage, and they actually use all the costumes and all the whole thing you would expect from, from a proper opera staging of a rabbit, I think. Um, but my experience is that. that and this is exactly what, what people really like, actually. This is... Uh, um, I don't know if, if, if they would get the same reactions if, if, if we did that with a, with a stage like that on the, on the rapid, I think. But... Um, um, yeah, your question actually is, if, if I'm coming from, from that, right? Yeah, definitely. So. Uh, it's about uh, also the German way of, of, of treating the old repertoire in, in, in theaters. Often the, there is nothing surviving from the, from the actual drama. It's, it's a reflection of the drama. This is something I, I very much like, actually. It's more, it's also here, it's, it's more the attitude of, of, um, of, of, of making you realize you're seeing an actor. That's actually the whole point of it. But it's making you realize this is life. It's also the, it's, it's really bad to present videos. I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's not even like sex with a condom. It's like, a, it's not. It's, uh, it, it, yeah. And, um, um, so, so actually giving you something, playing something, making music something, but at the same time making them aware that this is happening right now, in this very moment, that we can't be aware of others. This is, I think, this is a moment which is, uh, which should be one of the main focal points of our trade, to make you aware of that there is this unique point once in your life, and this is now. Can I ask a question related to that? And it might not be so far from Bjorn's question, really, Matthias, but thanks very much. That was great. Um, do you think that the, uh, if we use Bjorn's word, which I think is a really beautiful word, about magic, so do you think that the magic of the stylization of the opera performer um, has a greater intensity of being there now through its stylization yeah, absolutely. Than through the act of supposedly just communicating through yeah. words. It's already, a, it's, it's almost a verfremdungs effect, you know. I mean, this is so, so uh, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, um, I think 100 years ago it was, I'm, I'm not really into theater history, but yeah. I, I have this impression that 100 years ago it was pretty normal to have a singing actor on stage. And, uh, um, I mean, also the, the early films, I mean, if you hadn't had the singing scenes in the film, it would be not successful. It's a complete difference to today. Mm. Today they would run out of the cinema. Um, um, so yes, this is, uh, uh, if you have this, this, this yeah. I talk too much. So <laughs> It's, it's an Überhörung, we say. Überhörung, which is like uh, making things bigger than they are. Yeah. 
and uh, um, it's, the arti it's actually the artificiality of opera which makes it so concrete. And is there something, because I detect in what you're doing, that there's an attempt to rediscover a kind of experience yeah. or a perception? Yeah, that is, is this linked to, to your project? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. In the end, it's about reality. It's about being here and now and uh, seeing and watching. <laughs> yeah, and of course, the, the paradox, of course, is in, in all of your pieces, yeah. Everything's moving. Yeah. It's a lot about moving. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. It's like the, you know, I like these early experiences. <laughs> so when I have my counterpoint, uh, I'm just sat at home and doing the counterpoint things. Uh, and I have this electric piano where I could dial in my organ sound made a really loud and fun uh, exercises and I had my pencils on the piano and then at some at certain intervals the, the pencil would vibrate suddenly, so suddenly the, this movement inside the counterpoint was externalized into a mechanical movement on the piano this was the source for several pieces like this so there's actually this, this externalization of inner movement mm. this is uh, a, a subject which uh, was repeating my work. I think this is kind of a call just basically expressed in far better words as usual what, what I was after. I think there is this element of which which you also expressed of actually you could maybe say even the authentic the mm. real of that 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 intrudes and, and um, uh, I think that's fascinating in particular because I think we all agree there is something slightly um, paradoxical about the way it, it, it does appear. Um, playing the expert here, playing, <laughs> um, not being, playing the expert, uh, I found very interesting how you kind of, the, the kind of way you, you move around towards this term opera. You know, both distancing yourself from it and embracing it. Um, um, and what I find interesting is that if you think about operatic history of, let's say, the last 50, 60 years, almost any opera that's kind of worth mentioning um, has always been written against the genre. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so there is a certain sense, um, and very often, and what I find interesting is that you actually embrace the genre title. Um, whereas, you probably know, um, Helmut Lachenmann, um, <laughs> you know, um, where you know, the, the opera is, is the, the genre title is music with images. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting as kind of, no, I'm not doing an opera. Yeah. Doing an opera, but um, there, there is that um, the perception that you can only approach that genre from an odd angle, from the side, mm. or from behind, almost. You know, you can't possibly um, embrace it openly. I wonder. I don't know how I can phrase this. Can make this into a question. Um, I wonder whether that has become kind of an operatic cliche or Absolutely, so. absolutely. <laughs> the total cliche of, of, of contemporary opera business. It's, all, it's, 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 it's anti operatic. People are not singing. It's really weird. Uh, the, uh, and I, I, the, the, this was one of my first thoughts as well. So when I decided uh, conceiving the, the, the Yes Opera, I immediately trashed singing. And then, um, and, 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 uh, actually, went also in the other chat that most consciousness of, 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 of uh, opera, most, as usual, they're brilliant, ex uh, brilliant um, ex exceptions. You know, it's, we are generalizing here to make a point. But there's a tendency to, to of composers concentrating not on the on the on, on what's happening on stage, but what's happening in the orchestra. And um, th 
that's where I realized, no, I'm a theater maker. And then I came up with this uh, really very simple definition of what, what actually is an opera. It's very simple, singing people on stage. And since I defined that for me, I'm constantly searching about what could be a stage for opera and what could be singing people. But it's all very simple, basically. And, um, it's actually hard for me to understand why 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 composers pick up commissions for operas and then completely go against them. I find it sad because there's, there's a have you ever thought of creating a new opera? Will you? <laughs> yes, yes, I mean, I think that there are subjects that lend themselves well to offers, but I think that I rest more in something uh, like a, a great man model or something. Like, I think it'd be interesting to do offers about dictators like Saddam Hussein or something like that. Actually, I have this idea, I mean, it's the mind of, of, of the writer of the, 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 the two offers. We want to create a musical about Adolf Hitler. Brooks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Brooks. <laughs> yeah. Time for it now. <laughs> but I find it actually, uh, uh, I find it more interesting to use this uh, this this, this uh, operatic energy for things which are not obviously suited to it. I perhaps have a question. Do you think that one of the things that was so well, I found it a bit jarring, or at least interesting, about Viola and then Catalina, uh, was that maybe what lends offer well to the art of today is that in a public space like this, people obviously know that it's art, and that they're not used to it, but by juxtaposing it with the sounds of the city and taking it outside of the walls of the opera, that by forcing it upon them, they have to view it as something sort of interesting because she's a great singer. They can't hear the music on the outside, only the people with the headphones on. But she's a great singer, and you can you can recognize that. But people weren't circling around her the same way they do with musicians on the Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica, or on the subway in Paris, or on a uh, U-Bahn wagon in Berlin. They just, you know, they're not doing that. They're not surrounding her as if she were a musician. And when she does, she kind of scares them away. Anyway, so what are your feelings about why is it so effective in a public space like this? Is there something counterpointal, counterpunctual between this opera, where you're doing it, and the cityscape? I, think the, the, I need to ask, effective for whom? Why is it so effective for whom? Ah, well, I, okay, well, you're right. I need to redefine my terms. Uh, perhaps is it effective uh, because for the people I mean, outside, it's not. It be different things. I mean, are you attaining your goals as an artist? Is that one thing? Is it effective for pushing forward what the mo what opera can do, or is it effective in the sense that you're getting a public to engage with opera in a way that they wouldn't normally because opera tickets are expensive or something like that, or they're not interested in opera. Those are at least three different ways in which. <laughs> 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 no, I actually, I thought do you mean effect or affect? Definitely effect. Effect. <laughs> um, I actually don't really know the answer to that. It's uh, if you, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily know if it's effective. It's, it's I just offer it. So uh, it depends completely on, 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 on the audience member and the individual one of the things it's effective. For well, the people outside, they they have a completely different experience than, than the people inside. Uh, not only in quality but also in kind of quantity or but it's, it's a, um, um, so 
interesting for the people inside is that they expect an artwork and uh, realize it's not, it's actually more than a lot more of it. It's, it's, it's like the, it's kind of a reality porn. <laughs> so uh, it's completely not artwork. And it, uh, it, it's actually by itself questioning what is an artwork. But it's not really effective in, 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 in like big artwork, but it's, it's a question actually what actually is here an artwork or not? Um, this I find very interesting. Well, this interests me. And, uh, I think that, that the role of music, that was one of the earlier questions, is um, for me, music in, in those kind of installations or pieces or, or installments is, is, more, is more of an energy source. I really regard it as an energy source for things to happen on the stage or on the water. And um, yeah. I'm not sure if I can answer this question, even though you gave me three options. <laughs> Actually okay because um, <laughs> anyway there's there's time to think about this and maybe talk some more about this if um, you all maybe want to join us because we're going for a drink now if you don't mind um, to um, a pub which is called the Left Bank which is uh, just around the corner most of you will know where it is on Gibson Street um, but I want to um, thank once again Matis for this um, beautiful talk and also Pierre for his participation as an expert and Carrie for reading out um, uh, your text so thank you again very much for coming. Yeah. <laughs>